Hi all, I'm Claire Kovacs. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Binghamton University Art Museum. And I want to welcome you all to this digital space to share in a conversation between Michal Hyman and Elizabeth Moser. Around the exhibition, Michal Hyman, Chronically Linked, which if you're local, you still have a chance to see before it closes on the 10th, so on Saturday. A few housekeeping rules before I introduce our speakers today. As you can see, the conversation is being recorded and it will soon be available via the Binghamton University Art Museum uh, YouTube page. Please keep yourselves muted during Michal and Elizabeth's conversation, but feel free to share questions or comments in the chat. We'll have time at the end for a moderated discussion. So at that time, please signal in the chat that you'd like to speak. Um, if you do it earlier, I might miss it. Uh, and you can you can do that either by adding a um, a comment to this effect in the chat box, or you can use the raise hand icon, and I'll moderate the conversation with questions in the order that folks sign up. For those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, the chat and raised hand icon are located in an icon in the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, likely at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, click the three dots, and that provides additional tools. So let's get to some quick introductions. Michal Hyman is a artist, curator, and member of the Tel Aviv Institute for Contemporary Psychoanalysis. She's a theorist, activist, and an activist whose work inhabits the spaces between art and therapy, photography and diagnosis, theory and praxis. As installations, video, sound, photography, performance, and archival displays, her work has been shown in venues such as the University uh, the University of Melbourne's Museum of Art, Documenta 10, the Cartier, the Jewish Museum in New York, the Museum of Modern Art in Satima City, the Von Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, the Museum Ludwig in Cologne, and the American University Museum in DC, as well as the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Hyman is the founder and director of an international and public benefit cor uh, corporation and academy of her own from 2018, which advocates gender equality, the eradication of sexual violence, mistreatment, and other forms of oppression, mainly in academic institutions and the fields of art and visual cultures. Elizabeth Moser is a director, actress, divisor, theater maker, and educator with a specialization in movement. She is currently developing a new work entitled Natural Causes based on the lives of environmental activists, in particular tree sitters. Mosher conceived and wrote Castle on the Hill, which she directed and premiered at the Binghamton University. It's a, based on Mosher, Moser's one woman play, The Asylum Project, drawn from the lives of patients of the Binghamton State Hospital, whose stories are expressed both physically and verbally. Moser performed the Asylum Project in New York City, Montreal, Boulder, and throughout New York State, including performances at the Cherry Arts in Ithaca. In 2019, Moser was selected to perform the Asylum Project in the International United Solo Theater Festival in New York City, where it received the award for Best Drama. So today we'll be focusing on the resonances and linkages between Moser and Hyman's works and their practice. So join me in welcoming them. Thank you both so much for, for joining us. Um, I am gonna just bear with me for another, another moment and then I'm gonna get out of the way. Um, I, I want to share with folks that may not be familiar a little bit more about our, sorry, I'm also admitting people here, multiple, uh, a little bit more about the Binghamton Asylum, which is the basis of so much of Elizabeth's work. Uh, the asylum was founded in 1858 by Edward Turner, and it was the first medically directed addiction treatment center in the United States. So it was the first asylum that treated alcoholism as a disease and not a social ill. It didn't last that long as a an inebriate asylum. It then turned into a more traditional uh, state asylum and went through a number of different iterations. It is uh, it is the building is still extant. It is a, a building that was that sits. We often call it the castle in Binghamton. It sits on a 200 acre hilltop on the city above Binghamton. It has a quasi medieval grandeur and hand carved staircases and stained glass windows, uh, which underscore the lofty goals of the institution, as well as the taste of the wealthy clients that they had originally hoped to attract. Uh, so the, the asylum went through a number of different iterations, and by the 1990s, it, like many other psychiatric um, hospitals across the country, deinstitutionalized patients, and in 1993, the building was closed. Um, so I'll let 
Elizabeth fill in more details about the the people, but I wanted to give you all a little bit of a sense of the, the framework. Um, so I am going to get myself out of the way and just start with an early question, which is, Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about the Asylum Project and then take it away, both of you? Thank you so much, Claire. I'm really happy to be here with you and Michelle Hyman today. Um, and was so grateful to be able to perform several of the characters from the Asylum Project in conjunction with Michal's exhibit in the museum. Um, the Asylum Project is um, based on a story that was shared with, what well, was first inspired by a story, a true story that I learned when I was taking a tour of the asylum. And I learned about a woman named Agnes who had been a patient there for 70 years at 70. Um, she had been in, admitted in the, um, in, in the early 20s. And that's a picture of Agnes surrounded by her family in, um, that might be like around 1990, 1985. Um, excuse me, is it 25? Yeah. And then this is a picture to, to the left on your screen is a picture of Agnes and her sister. Um, Agnes um, em emigrated from Poland um, and uh, arrived in the States around 1914. And she married uh, a Russian immigrant. They moved to upstate New York. Um, there was a house fire um, and Agnes was there alone with her, with her son and um, she was able to get out of the fire. Her son was four at the time, um, but with she suffered severe trauma from the fire and she was also hit on the head by uh, a beam. So um, she was then brought to the Binghamton State Hospital for care, um, but because of her, she was suffering in my mind. Um, there, are, I've never seen any medical records, of any of the patients that I embodied or learned about, but that she suffered post-traumatic stress syndrome. And um, soon after she was admitted to the hospital, her husband took her son and moved away and to never return. And her husband told her son that her, his mother had died. So his whole life, uh, Paul, in my play, it becomes Pauli, um, believes that his mother is dead. In his, when he's in his 60s, um, he learns through very kind of circuitous route via his daughter. His daughter, um, the granddaughter of Agnes, wants to find out where her grandmother is buried. So she starts, and this is before the internet, and she starts to make phone calls and um, using clues that her father had little, little bits of memories that he, he would call snapshots. Um, and he, they were so elusive, but they were strong nonetheless, but he, he couldn't understand the links of them. And one of them was a, a red brick building with white trim on a hill. And that indeed was ended up being the Binghamton State Hospital. So his daughter started calling operators trying to find out where his grandmother might be buried. Well, lo and behold, they say, well, that sounds like Binghamton State Hospital. The daughter calls the Binghamton State Hospital and finds out, oh, this moment always gets me, that um, Agnes is not dead, that she's been in the hospital for decades now and is still alive. So Paul's daughter says, dad, I have some news. Your mother didn't die in, in that fire. She's alive and she's been living in the Binghamton State Hospital all this time. Now, during her stay at the Binghamton State Hospital in the 50s, she was lobotomized. And she had, at this time, um, when they do become reunited with Agnes, and this picture is amazing. Um, you see here Agnes surrounded by her family, and that's Paul sitting right next to her, and then her grandchildren, the other people are her grandchildren. And 
at this point, Agnes had stopped speaking, had kind of um, introverted into this kind of a shape, um, wasn't walking, but through contact with her family, they were speaking Polish to her. They were singing Polish songs. They were petting her hand um, and speaking gently and kindly and she and their love, right? <laughs> Agnes actually got up and started to dance with them a little bit, right? And um, to speak and she actually spoke the words, I love you. And all of this is, um, so when I heard this story, obviously uh, it's an amazing story and it's a true story. Um, I was compelled to make a theater work around it. And in the play, I play Agnes. I play her daughter, Lena, who's searching for any, anything she can find about her mother. She doesn't know that her mother's alive, but during the course of the play, she does find out her mother's alive and goes to see her mother. In the play, I then transition between daughter and mother back and forth in and out of the wheelchair. And they're holding each other and they're speaking to each other um, from daughter who's somewhat youthful to the mother who's old and, and barely speaking, but can say her daughter's name and so forth. And then I play three other characters who are patients during the time that, uh, here's some pictures here of the performance. The picture of this movement is um, a motif, a spinning motif that's found in the play. And I think this is either right before the intake um, when there's this voice that comes to um, ask, Agnes questions, which she can't answer, partly because she's so confused, so distraught, and English is her second language. So she's coming out of this whirlwind. And then the, the other picture is when Agnes comes to this country full of hope and excitement, carrying all of her belongings in that one suitcase. She came here from Poland with her mother. Um, and um, that's a picture of Agnes um, when she wakes up. She gets knocked out in the fire. I play the uh, whole scene of the fire. She falls down on this table and then there's a big slam and that represents the slamming of the door of the asylum. And she wakes up and she's startled and she doesn't know where she is and it's this harsh white light and that's what that photograph is. That's... Agnes trying to make sense of the voice that's asking her these questions that she can't answer. It's part of the admissions test. Um, and uh, um, Michal can talk to her about her creation around the test. Maybe this is a nice uh, segue to you, Michal, to talk about um, your creation around the test um, that you created. Hello everyone. I'm so touched and you know that uh, by this story of you. Um, since 2010, um, because of an encounter I had with a portrait that in England, in an asylum that I, I felt it was myself. I know it cannot be because it was taken 150 years ago, but when I look at the photograph, there is no doubt that it's me. I'm about 15 and a half. I think I know the reasons how I arrived there. Just lately, I found out. But then I started to, to read and I went to London and uh, to the actual asylum. Um, but all of that came after many, many years of um, trying to understand a visual test that are 
produced, I don't know how to say it, but they are built by psycholo psychologists in, like, this is the thematic, what you see in the left is the thematic of perception test, right? And this is my test. So I started um, after studying painting and after studying uh, uh, sculpture and, uh, and, uh, and the video, uh, I had an encounter also with a psychologist uh, and at the meeting, she took out in the session uh, seven visual tests. I could not understand why it's her, she's a psychologist, why she's showing me a visual test, but I felt a lot and later I started to make a research uh, and trying to understand what are these boxes from which she took the images. And she asked me to tell stories about them. And I felt my whole body is participating in this diagnosis. It's like something was reaching inside me and Part of the images were very violent. You can see here, like, what story you can tell about that. I mean, and you also in kind of, um, they're doing it a lot uh, now, much less, but a, a really important part of studies of psychology in the 20th century was studying about uh, uh, an evaluation test because uh, will you admit, will we admit you? To, I mean, to hospital or not, whatever was through this test, it was a major thing. Institutes used it. And uh, so I started to try and find this box, the thematic of perception test. Of course, all psychologists didn't want to give it to me. They say that they don't have it, it's somewhere else. Like it was a secret of what the images are like inside this uh, project. And in the situation, I felt trapped in a closed system and a monotical. And I was uh, facing uh, purposely ambivalent images, which can be, a, I mean, interpreted, interpreted in various ways. And I was exposed uh, a need to, of analysis system to uncover mine and my unconscious secret. And of course, by that, I've already become a predetermined product to the psychologist, a fruit ripe for diagnostic. And as a person for which the visual is rooted so deep in the soul, I was asked to talk about these images. These sessions were pioneering, hurting, and stressful. Yet the visual test hit me and filled me with curiosity as an archivist with boxes. And we spoke about uh, late uh, before we spoke about suitcases from a young age. And the space between the museum, which is, let's admit, another hermeneutical system, right? You accept it and people tell you what to do and curators. And if you don't, I mean, it's also a place which you, you can be. And um, uh, the treatment room clinic and the subject and the viewer of the art were very similar to me, like the test I had in this clinic, which is very, very uh, interesting. So I started uh, to try and understand, and you can see here, uh, this is in Binghamton now. And I, think that I will maybe have as a private person uh, the, the biggest collection of visual tests that were um, built by different university and different people during the 20th century. Some of them failed, some of them succeeds. And they're amazing. If you, You'll have to believe me that some of them concerning light, concerning time, concerning things that are supposed to be important uh, for museums are much more interesting than many uh, exhibitions. The distance between the, the, the patient, uh, the light there, how many sessions you come in and out. So I started to 
follow the lines of those tests and make my own tests. So I replaced the content of the TAT of the psychologist and I made my own test and I started to put instead of their image, it's exactly the same sizes. I mean, and I called my test Michal Hyman test and instead of the TAT of the psychologist, I called it MHT for Michal Hyman test. And I first showed it in Documenta. I mean, it's not the first, it's the only time. Uh, I, I showed this uh, somehow this uh, and it was a, a, a quite um, a political and also uh, and I've sent six young curators that I trained them for six months with psychologists also I learned them I mean with me it was like they said documenta we have a table we have two chairs who's going to come why anyone would be interested to, to look at our box and I said them I'm sure it won't be the the I don't know and thousand people came to my table and we have recorded not thousand but not I mean hundreds of people talking about photographs I think it's the first time that there was a conversation in a museum place the two people talking about so what I took from my experience with this psychologist was to let people talk about stories coming out from a box and tell stories. And this was my first test, the Michal Hyman test. And now uh, I have all this recording. It's amazing to look at them after so many years. And, uh, and the second text was a green box, which we need a, uh, time to, to talk about it and that was already a couch that people spoke but anyway what I want to say is that um, I collected not only the history of, te of visual test but also I learned some of the of the of the test and replaced my stuff in and they're all now uh, shown in the Binghamton but the difference between some other exhibition, this exhibition uh, is that the tests are not uh, activated. Like it can be also that they will really do, like I will have people working for me and we will do this performance and this uh, activation of the test. But here we just see the images. So just oh. I want to say Elizabeth, it, it wouldn't happen that I would start my dress project and the asylums, if not the last test, which is after Zondi, it's called the Zondi test, the, the, the Dondi test, that there were all, um, all the connections later to find the photograph I'm in the asylum. So it, I mean, it's not for today, but I needed all these 30 years of process with the test and understanding this to arrive to this photograph and start the asylums project. Thank you. For I that had a beautiful time. encounter with, with John Tag, who is here. Hi, John. Because uh, uh, someone introduced me to him and with my test. And, and then he was the one, one of those that immediately, like without much talking, he understood, oh, there is something here between, I mean, our thought and about archives, but about also the visual. And um, and uh, that's why I'm here in Binghamton because John really loved him. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. I found um, when I was developing my intake questions um, for my play. I was in the doc, my doctor's office one day and I found this <laughs> and I stole it, of course, before the doctor came in. And this helped me um, devise my own, you know, part of my script. Um, my script um, is, is, it's a voiceover. We, it's an, a disembodied voice, kind of like um, coming from all directions uh, to Agnes and her startled, um, fearful, confused, very confused state. 
And um, I also had another book um, that also assisted me. Um, and it was a, um, a person's personal reflection on her experience of psychosis and some of the questions that she was asked upon admittance. And then with this um, piece of paper and that uh, personal description um, by someone who had experienced it, and then with my, mixed together with my imagination, came up with my own intake for Agnes. Um, some of the questions were, who is the president? Who, what year is it? Where are we? Name three common objects such as apple, table, penny. Take the word world and spell it backwards. And these were things that at that moment, Agnes simply was not capable of doing. And that kind of sealed her fate. So um, one of the things that Mikhail and I have discussed is the commonality of the institutionalization of women, of immigrants. I'm putting some words into your mouth, but this is what I found common in reading your material, Mikhail, and, um, and reflecting on my own, is um, in, um, the institutionalization of women, um, immigrants, people um, without much financial means, people um, who are struggling emotional crises and other things. And then both uh, Mikhail and I came across this um, in our research, you know, separately, different times. And it's pretty amazing. Um, perhaps those of you who are here today could take a look at it. And uh, I don't know if you want to respond to any of these, Mikhail. Elizabeth, yeah, uh, yeah. I want to say that um, when I found it, I, I started in my lectures to make with one of with my assistant, we're doing a performance retreat. And I would like you, because your English is so much better, but can you read like some of the reason? Because what I'm doing in this performance, that in the end, even if we thousand people in the lecture or 200 or 50, everyone can admit the reason to admit to these places. Even reading one of the ones I really like, like, I mean, it's the novel reading. Right. Novel Novel reading. reading novels was a reason yes. for being admitted. Novel reading novels, especially for women, was a reason for admission. So can you read some of them? Surely. Thank you, Michal. Um, um, egotism. <laughs> uh, laziness. Marriage of son. Masturbation and syphilis. Uh, menstrually deranged, opium habit, overaction of the mind, overstudy of religion, tobacco and masturbation, masturbation for 30 years. Masturbation was a big one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm making light of it, but obviously it's not funny. Um, bloody flux brain fever, mm, feebleness of intellect, female disease, uh, dissipation of nerves, women trouble, venereal excesses, uterine derangement, time of life, suppression of menses and so on there's one that's uh, dressing red i can't find it now so i usually in the in my lecture i i i'm just dressed with red things so i'm already in <laughs> where is it the one with the red <laughs> seeing it. i see immoral life which one of my um one of the characters in my play was um, and institutionalized because she was considerably morally corrupt. Um, yeah. One of the patients I play had ideas that 
didn't jive with current society. They were um, about desegregation. Another one of my characters was, um, I think just was manic, you know, and very childlike. Um, I don't see the red. Does anyone else see red? It's another list from other areas. Yeah, okay. But I want to say that not about women, um, of course, it's also admissions from men, but I just want to emphasize one thing. Okay, so women didn't have the rights on their bodies and not on their children and not on their property. Uh, but one thing which I am really, is that the, the difference with men and women, that not that men had paradise and that were sent, but most or oh, big portion of men were also um, released later. Most of the women, especially in Venice and San Servolo, where I, I, I did a research, never went, never, never. Men went back to work after one year or two years, but not women. They all died there. But I found out, yeah, this is in Venice. And on this woman on the right, her name is Maria. I, in London, I found my whole, my whole self there. But in Venice, I found my gaze on the on Maria on the face of Maria my gaze arrived 20 years later after uh, I was in London it's, it's it's a whole story but you can see that because there's already um in London it's 1085 so a photography was starting around 100 39 and in London it's 185 where my when my portrait was taken here it's 180 80. so in Venice there is already a real archive with the reasons for admissions and with I mean with a lot of stuff it's in Latins uh, um, so this woman Maria she was hospitalized she had two children she committed suicide in the end uh, in the San Servolo place. She has hallucinations um, mainly because they ate only corn and there was a dis disease that came from corn. Anyway, what I want to say that the first woman, the, the, the difference between men and women that women didn't have the right of hearing. I mean, that's what I'm saying, not the men in part of it. At least they said, no, I didn't do it. But women didn't have the right to say anything. So the first woman ever that had uh, the right of fear and she achieved this is uh, Elizabeth Peckard. I've made this short movie about her called Hearing. And she, it's the end of, uh, of the 19th century. So it's really very difficult times. But then what I found out with you, Elizabeth, is the story I was really, really inside the 19th century. But when I heard your story about the 20th century, mm -hmm. and I mean, and what you did with that, it's a, thank, thanks to Claire that she, she, she matched, I mean, that she introduced you to me because like, I feel like um, another soul. <laughs> I have a question for you, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. If it's okay. okay. You know why you attracted to these asylums and to these women and to all of this? I mean, it's a question probably asking ourselves um you know i never really thought about why i was attracted i felt the attraction deeply strongly it propelled me for years of research creation hours and hours in the studio performances and i'm still in love with the work um I think partly when there were images when I was growing up of different asylums that stayed with me, that never ever left me. 
that broke my heart. Um, I, some in New York City and on Long Island that of, of young people being left alone with barely any clothing, um, surrounded by their own waste. Um, and that's hard to hear. And it was, it as a young, I was very young when I, when I, I remember seeing a documentary on TV and that really stayed with me. And I never, and I never thought like, I wasn't certain like, oh, I want to do a piece about this that never occurred to me. But once I was in the building and felt the lives of these people, the people who had worked there, the people who had visited, the people who had lived there. It was palpable to me and um, it inspired me. And then once I started doing research, um, I was reading about so many people's personal stories and about um, psychiatric care through the late 19th century and, and early to mid 20th century. And then I also was able to do quite a few interviews because Binghamton State Hospital is local. I was able to interview people who, who had worked there, who had been patients there, who um, had had family members there. Um, so that was life changing for me to be able to really be in conversation with these individuals and to hear their stories and to be gifted with their um, trust and their experiences um, gave me the courage and the desire to embody these people and to bring their voices to light, their amazing tenacity, their amazing faith, courage, desire for connection and love and and life right and their and the heartbreak that so many of these people suffered the um exclusion the lack of co of connection to family society and friends um was so devastating the misunderstanding of them the the lack of our ability as a culture and, a, and medicine and where, you know, how to help these people, right? And so often they were forgotten, as you said, just left there for decades and decades. Um, and then also I would say, bringing, bringing these unique insights to, to so many of us who, uh, many of us don't have these signs, of connections to people who've been institutionalized for, for long periods of time and throughout history. You know, these stories have gone unspoken, unshared, right? So it was a great opportunity to share these voices of these remarkable individuals. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph of production of Castle on the Hill, which is the, the larger play. Um, um, and we have a nurse here, and that was based on an interview I did with a, a, a woman who um, was a nurse at the hospital. And then above her is an incredible um, person based on um, this person, Lucy Ann slash Joseph Israel Lobdell, who um, was placed in the institution because he was a transgender man. And I found the original lunacy um, court case that put Lucien slash Joseph Israel Lobdell into the asylum. And we use that as a voiceover when um, Joseph comes into the institution and he's, his male clothes are taken off and he's forcibly put into female clothing. And we see this behind the scrim, the nurses are, are doing this and we hear in the voiceover people um, kind of hired, I would say through my investigation 
by her, his brother to um, get Joseph into the asylum. And then um, the brother was able to get all the property and other things that belonged to Joseph. And it's very, very, um, it's, it's more typical than we think for transgender individuals to have been uh, placed into institutions. And I know you have um, experience with that too, Mikhail, in your research in a very, yeah. I turn it over to you. No, in the San Salvador archives, there were 10,000 small photographs. I sat there for days. It's amazing, it's all in albums, very small. I think there is the glasses are not there in another place. And I looked and I looked and I started to make series. It's better not to see the, all the beaten women. And there is also a research I'm doing. There's one photographer that took most of these photographs, but he had the, uh, the, 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 the person that was the watch, how do you call the one that's watching the asylum? The, she, she was a female and she held the, the heads of the people and he took their photographs. It's, it's terrifying. So I'm also working on this photography where there was a series that I found more and more of uh, transgenders. It just, and I, I, I made a series with, with them. And it's also, you can see them on the right up here uh, in the Binghamton Museum. So there's a lot of, um, and I think Elizabeth, that I would like you to show us what you did with my exhibition. I was so honored that you did a uh, um, performance with my work. I think this is something so special. Mm. It was really, really special, Michal. Uh, I love your exhibit. And I was um, a couple of weeks ago, this is this photograph here is an, um, a shot from the balcony in the museum. and my part of my set I did uh three of the characters from from the asylum project and um in front of me, uh, these photographs that Michal has made um we can if you want to show some more photos from the performance Claire that would be great if we're able to see them yeah and we can just kind of scroll through them but I love the juxtaposition of my embodiment in oh, hmm. in relationship to the photographs. Um, there's a lot of time traveling going on, right? Hmm. I just want to tell the people that they haven't been to the exhibition that I, in the asylum in London, I saw that I'm sitting there with uh, with the dress, checked dress, which was the uniform of the asylum. So I decided to make myself the dress. And then I realized that I decided to go with this dress and um, to go to the 19th century through photography, because I believe photography can do things that... Uh, Nothing can do photography, video, whatever is, tra is transparency and whatever it's quality. And because it's also photography is um, immoral in a way. And I needed to, in order to infiltrate into places, I needed the tool that, which is immoral, the camera and whatever with photography, I believe it's immoral in a way. So I made myself the dress, but then I said, how can I go on my own to this era? no rights for women, even not the right of hearing, how I'm going to say, hey, I am Michal Hyman from the 21st century and it's just a project I'm doing, entering the asylum. No one is going to let me. So I decided and I took photos in the same dress of 150 people, which there are my community of women. It's not only women, it's also men. And, and the photographs are about that and which each of them, I tried to, uh, to show them the original book um, where I found my, my portrait um, called The Face of Madness. Um, and the editor is uh, just the professor, you remember? 
Um, so I was talking with each one and trying to find a, a tactic to how to infiltrate to the asylum in the 19th century. So we took old photographs of other photographers and we also, so there is 300 tactics that I took in order to infiltrate to the asylum itself. This um, is Rose and she's railing against being, um, um, what do you call it, uh, sterilized um, without her consent. Uh, this is her diving into a river to commit suicide because she had been, um, in, she was pregnant, but it, uh, I won't go into the backstory. And this is um, Bonnie, who is fascinated by physical science and, and plants and oxygen. And she's, um, she's got a lot of energy. <laughs> and this is Willa, who um, is based on a real person named William Moore, who, whose daughter I was able to interview. And William also wrote an autobiography. And there's uh, a song written about him. And uh, he was an anti-segregationist mm -hmm. and was en route to deliver a letter to the governor of Mississippi, where very sadly uh, he was shot dead. Um, but he was in the Binghamton State Hospital for a year and a half. He was released. So that, you know, that correlates with what you were saying, Mikhail, about men versus women. Um, because his, and they were trying to knock his ideas out of his head through electric shock therapy and insulin shock therapy. I, I just want to say that uh, I forgot before, but the one who edited the book, Face of Medicine, is uh, Professor Sandra Gilman. But I also want, I want to read something that I wrote, a lamentation, not only for women and not only in people asylum, but also for, for the child of this woman that you did. What was his name? Oh, finally? Oh. Yeah, because you, you, you say that his evidence were snapshots. Now, till now, women or other people that were um, are, are blamed for not have any coherent memories, language. So I wrote something I want to read for all of us and all of them. Sorry, if sometimes my English will know. Do trauma survivors lack a reflecting language? Not at all. They have an eloquent language of silence, anger attacks, dullness, body touches, testimonies coming and going, inconsistently, memories floating and disappearing. Is there a language more eloquent than this? Is there anything? more shared, even if it would take years to build the index of the loyal representation of the world's fracture, index new order, it will happen. And we will be the ones to set it, determining it. That's it. No more obedience in and outside of the clinic. Will we allow them a monopoly on rep representing the symbolic order? And we would be left with representations of the unthinkable, of the unimaginable, so that we could stuff all our hallucinations in there? No.
Thank, Thank you. you. Claire, do you want to? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was. I was Thank going you. to uh, ask you. you both if you you were going to ask me something first. So go ahead, oh, Elizabeth. While you're speaking, Claire, we can scroll through more photos. Would that be okay? Yeah. Um, do you want to direct me what photos you would like me uh -huh. to scroll through? Yeah. Any of the the Asylum Project or Castle on the Hill project? Uh, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. I can I can do that. Um, I wanted to as um, as I do this, I wanted to prompt the two of you uh, if there are things that you haven't covered just yet um, to to do that, and because I want to make sure that we also have time for questions, comments, reflections from the audience. So I'll mute myself again and, and scroll away. If we could pause here for a sec, this might be of interest. Thank you, Claire. Um, this was just me working in the studio um, and I started to use the chalkboard that was there. And I started to, um, because I was playing five different characters, I was um, doing some physical dramaturgy and looking at chakras, what were balanced, what were spastic, what were closed and um, kind of going through the, the play um, with each character and finding, you know, what organ um, spoke for them. Was it their heart, their brain, their liver? Um, did they, were they more synovial fluid or more bone? And so this is some charting of that. It's amazing, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. And that's this as well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, this is interesting because I look at each character and um, look at, you know, if, are the, what's speaking loud, loudest to me. Like for Rose, it was blood. It was the lymph, pus, pile, kidneys. There was a, a bitterness about her, this like about her. And so that really fueled me. Um, Whereas Bonnie was air and breath, thought, ideas, connecting flight. Um, Agnes was earth, flesh, intestines, juicy, fertile, ripe. Um, uh, Lena was mind, trying to put things together, the neuroendocrine system. And, and Willa was justice, um, cognating the thyroid, the third eye being able to see the big picture, making connections, the seventh and sixth chakras, feeling connected to a message. So that was some of the way that I was doing physical dramaturgy that allowed me to swiftly change from character to character. Um, the picture on the right is when Lena, Paulina, Pauli, learns that her mother is alive. This is a picture of Castle on the Hill. Again, the same. Um, these were students. These are all students here at Binghamton University um, doing Castle on the Hill. So uh, and this is a picture of Benny with the plant. And over here is that um, episode that I described to you of Joseph being taken out of his clothes and being put into other clothing. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Are there any um, images, Michal, that you would like? Um, our oh, um, so much. I, I, I'm <laughs> so thankful. Well, I, I wanted to, um, you know, just take a moment as the, the, the woman behind the curtain to, to 
to point out one one part that I was trying to subtly suggest in the uh, in the in the slideshow, which is that one thing that's really struck me about both of you is the um, the connections to to archive and archival process. And so, Michal, I I um, I don't think you've seen well, you might have seen this picture just today, but what we did for Elizabeth's performance is we put together a um, a little a little vitrine of her archival materials that echoes these types of yeah, these yeah, types well. of vitrines that are that are in the show. Um, wow. And I, I just wanted to, you know, point out a couple more just big picture ideas. Um, and I see that there are hands. And so I'm just going to point these out and uh, and then get out of the way again for for questions. But just um, and these are ideas that the two of you have brought up um, in past conversations and, and Elizabeth thinking about the the slippage of time and space between both of your works and these the the concept and the breaking down of spatial and temporal but borders thinking about gaze and imagined gaze and those those things moving back and forth so I just wanted to to pull those things together because there are so many linkages between your work and and the conversations that we've all been having have been so fruitful so um, I want to thank you for that but I also want to um, turn it over to a little bit of time for questions from the audience so if you're interested I see one hand already um, which I'll get to in a second but if you yeah. are interested in um, in in asking a question, either if you can put your hand up um, with the with the logo or the little icon, or you can type into the chat that you would like to uh, to ask a question. But our our first, oh, go ahead, Amira. Claire, can yes. you just uh, let us uh, go out of the presentation so can we can see yeah. each other? Yep, absolutely. Give me just a moment. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. Um, there so so claudia your hands up so um if you want to unmute yourself and uh the floor is yours hi elizabeth hi michael and all of you um i'm completely touched and i i was you know i'm elizabeth's friend and i remember the first time i saw her performing it was incredible for me and I'm a psychologist from Brazil, so I worked in Brazil in these places, and I know how it is to be a patient in this place, and I also am so grateful for both of you for the work that you do in, uh, in bringing this to light in the way you do. and. Um, I feel it's very connected to what I believe we are here to do. I, I, I connect in so many levels and I can, um, I'm here like so touched in my heart of also remembering so many parts of me that I'm sure had this kind of life as well. And what I, I, I'm here to say thank you. I have many, many questions. I don't want to, uh, I don't know even how to start my questions. I would love to be with both of you or uh, like uh, for the afternoon so we could share and talk and rejoice in what we love. Um, and um, I just pray that with this awareness that we have, that we can break stigma for people that are suffering right now. And uh, that this is a light that come to the earth and we can be a vehicle for this to transmute and transform. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, so much. And we can have an afternoon. I'm here in New York till the end of January. Oh, wonderful. So I, love, I would love to, to meet and to talk more. And Wonderful. So I'm more than so happy to. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. That was, that was 
yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, really appreciate it. Thank there you. Other, for... Oh, it's our, our pleasure. Um, there are other folks that have questions, comments, reflections. I want to say something now after Claudia spoke. There is so much work to do and we know that we are in a really dark times from different aspects. And looking um, at Elizabeth, which is coming from the theater and from performance and I'm coming from the arts. I've been a patient for a long time. I remember myself when I was six years old, I was with my mother uh, in my parents' room and my father was nervous at that time. And not that it was too bad or something like that, but I say to my mother, mom, it was me and my little brother and her, mom, let's go, take a suitcase and let's go. I wanted, it was too tensed. While when the three of us were together, it was so nice. My mother was funny and we had a good time with her and she was acting to us. And then there was, it was different. So in, in a very naive way, I said, and she said to me, and we're talking about the 20th century and we're talking about in the 60s, where shall I go? Where shall we go, Michali? Michali, she called me. I have no money, I don't have a job. Everyone will look at us. I mean, so I understood, although I was very little that she thought about it before. And her answer uh, can be the same answer for many women and many men now and many people now as well. And uh, we have a lot ahead of us to do. And I think the arts and performance, uh, myself, I'm doing, trying to build uh, mediating um, between uh, therapy and uh, I think Elizabeth is doing as well. And I think education and the arts, this is our future, good future if we will work on it. The only way. Thank you, Nicole. Sharon, I saw that you had unmuted before. Did you have a, a question? If not, it's okay. Um, sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi. I'm half in between work, but I really enjoyed listening to everybody. I loved uh, this project so much. I didn't get to see the whole group, so it was so great, um, Lisa, to see the Lisa Elizabeth to see the the photos of uh, what was done at Binghamton that was really groovy <laughs> I just I um I kind of chimed in occasionally as as Lisa Elizabeth was developing this and it was really great for me but um I'll just add one thing because I don't have much time but one thing my father told me that my that his aunt Nora was put away in an institution called Willard and um, in upstate New York. And he didn't know much about her except that she had had a cataract operation uh, that she liked to smoke. And when she finally got her operation and she could see what clothes that they were giving her, they were these frumpy, weird house dresses and she complained like crazy and wanted to uh, get better clothing. And, um, and I was listening to hours and hours that Elizabeth had shared. Um, and one of the nurses in Willard told a story of a woman named Nora, who was my dad's aunt's name, Aunt Nora, who um, had a cataract operation and complained about her clothing and how she smoked. And it was amazing to me. I don't know if it's true, but it was the same institution that she went to. 
And I figured it out and the timing seemed okay. And it just fascinated me that in a very bizarre way that I connected with my great aunt in a way, if it was indeed her, but I can't imagine otherwise. It's just too freaky. It's just too freaky that those things happened, that that nurse, and I saved the recording. Of course, I shared it with my family and I have a big family and they were like, oh, wow, whatever. But I was like, what? You know, this is crazy. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was great listening to you guys. And I love the idea of getting more and more awareness. Um, I mean, you know, basically my, this, my great aunt Nora was um, institutionalized for disagreeing with her husband. Period. <laughs> and all of us, the, all the women in my family, um, we're, we're pretty big and loud and we're all artists on some level. And so it was just amazing. Like, wow, you know, we've come a long way. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that uh, Elizabeth was able to dig up this story was really so great and to bring it to life. And, you know, I just... I just think there's a wealth of information, just the way that, like with my teaching, I, I've dealt with people with so many disabilities and just the way that even um, like autism, you know, <laughs> you know, people are not put away for that anymore. And um, I know functioning artists, comedians, dancers who have autism and how well they're doing and functioning now. I just love the leaps that we've made and thank you all for doing this <laughs> being involved thank you so much sharon <laughs> john i i see that you're unmuted go ahead yes uh, thank you thank you all for this conversation and i i wanted to say that um i remember seeing elizabeth's performance um at the cherry and um, you may recall that after it, when I wrote to thank you for it, I sent you some uh, images uh, from Dr. Diamond, uh, precisely because and we should remember it's a, it's a, a one person show. So that you're, you're, even though you're playing six characters, it's always your body isolated formally in, in this very sparse set just as the bodies are isolated in um, Hugh Welsh Diamond's um, photographs. So I, and also of course, you're wearing um, those institutional cotton dresses and that was another connection. So I'd sent you those images um, as a way, that was my way to connect uh, with what you were doing at the thank you. And then I was in, um, LA and went to see Michal's show at the American um, uh, Jewish University and walk in and there she is working on Dr. Diamond and the dress. And so it seemed that this had to come together. Though I'll say again, I, I said it a few weeks ago, bringing it all together, a huge amount of work for Elizabeth and Michal, but also for Claire to make these elements actually work together in this um, beautifully curated and presented show. Uh, and it actually happened. And the fact that it happened in Binghamton University in the shadow of the castle is I think a very moving thing. And, uh, and it works, the, the things belong together. Uh, though your work was made without any knowledge of each other. Um, so I hope you'll make more work from this, uh, this wonderful encounter in Binghamton. Thank you all. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right, well, I'm, I'm cognizant of time and know that we're, we're running over. So I just wanna um, thank both Michal and Elizabeth again, and for John for being the, the catalyst of the seed of, of, of all of this, and for all of you for joining and sharing your experiences. And um, yes, thank you so much and have a, a beautiful afternoon. <laughs>